Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and uh, excited to talk to you about bipolar disorder. And uh, I bring a very personal approach to bipolar disorder, and I am a staunch advocate of, about bipolar education and research. And um, my topic tonight uh, is titled um, Barriers to Care for People with Bipolar Disorder, Manic Depression, as I prefer to call it and other mental illnesses. Uh, and by care, I mean a broad definition of care. I mean medical care, and also I mean a broader sense of care uh, in terms of society caring as far as concern, support, understanding, and uh, availability to meet the needs of people. I don't mean just medical care, I mean really being there for our um, society members in every way and supporting them. Um, and I, um, I term um, manic depression or bipolar disorder as bleeding on the inside, and I will talk more about that later. Um, before I get into the, that topic of barriers to access to care, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, so you know uh, a bit about my history and uh, where I'm speaking from. Um, I was raised in... Um, a home I would best describe as tumultuous. It was um, predictable only in its unpredictability. I come from an immigrant, immigrant family and I learned wonderful values from my parents. Hard work, honesty, integrity. Um, I have three older sisters. However, our home was always in a state of flux. Um, at times, my father was charming and iridescent and he did spontaneous wonderful things and I thought he was magical and I adored him. Um, I also resonated with him on, on an unspoken level. He and I are still very very close and at other times my father would come home a different man. He was um, violent he was a monster, he was terrifying, and uh, still at other times, he was depressed to the point that he would sit in a dark room with a loaded gun in his lap for days at a time. And um, as those cycles changed, the longer he stayed in one cycle, this pressure grew, especially when he was in the fun-loving, boyishly charming cycle, because we always knew that cycle could not last and that something would change and he would come home and I could tell by the sound of his footsteps in the doorway that he was going to blow up that night and uh, fly to a rage and uh, hurt someone uh, whether there was a reason or not. We, you could feel it coming, you could feel the air change. And um, we never talked about it. We didn't know what was wrong. There was no language for this. That was just our life. Um, I was a very lonely, oddball kid, and I was depressed a lot of the time. Uh, I grew up in the outdoors. My best friends were animals. And uh, I remember oftentimes in middle school, life hurt so much, I just really wanted to not be alive. I really wished I was dead although I didn't really think about how to make that happen. But I was a classic misfit, very, very unhappy. Of the four of us girls, um, I often heard, you're just like our dad, and dad likes you best. And uh, my sisters seemed to adapt better to the world in many ways than I did. Well, I left home when I was 16. I got married when I was 17. I had two children and was divorced when I was 23. I was a single mother on welfare. Uh, I realized very quickly that, um, that the first job that I had would barely pay for child care. And um, I went to school on welfare rather than being on a minimum wage job. Uh, I did four years of pre-medical studies uh, in Washington State in three years time as a single mother of two beautiful little girls. Um, I was accepted into medical school at the University of Washington 
from an undergraduate school that did not have a pre-med program. And um, I went to the University of Washington Medical School and graduated and also did my residency training through that program. Um, during medical school, I attended a group for um, parents in medical school, parents with small children, a support group. And um, the facilitator of that group asked me to see her separately, and she said, Suzanne, you're depressed. And uh, I didn't know what depression was because I'd never been asked about my feelings or thought about my feelings my entire life. So it was quite the eye-opener, and that began my journey of self-discovery into feelings and uh, everything else. Um, she put me on Prozac, and I was on it through the remainder of med school as well as um, residency training. Uh, I graduated from medical school with honors. I received an honor that was given to one student out of my class of 175 to the student who best exemplified the compassion and caring that is exhibited in a physician. I was chief resident of my medical uh, residency program. Uh, I wanted to keep up with the guys, and I did. I was macho, I loved the emergency room, the life and death stuff. I felt alive during those times. Um, and so that's how life went. Until um, in 1986, a tragedy in my family um, caused me to not sleep for about two weeks. And uh, life unraveled, and I just really went uh, to a place where I was out of touch with reality and where I was suicidal. And I ended up hospitalized for two weeks at the Menninger Clinic in Kansas. And there I underwent a series of testing, and that was the first time anyone had ever told me, you're not just strange, you're not just odd, you have an illness, and it's called bipolar disorder. And um, at that time, I was in my mid-30s, and that's the first time things fell into place. And I really remember not believing at first, you mean there's a name for this? And I just wasn't born without an operating manual. Uh, it made sense as to what was wrong with my father, and uh, it made sense as to a lot of things. So from then on, I went home and I found a good psychiatrist in Seattle. Uh, I struggled a lot for the next eight years, coming to terms with, with what being bipolar meant. And uh, the hardest thing for me was feeling that I lived a double life. I was Dr. Fiala, very well respected in my community and I felt like I was wearing a mask and that no one knew who I really was because inside I was the elephant man. I would be horribly depressed. I would feel like I was hemorrhaging on the inside many, many times and there was absolutely no one I could talk to about it except for one sister who ended up having two children who are bipolar also. And in my entire world, she is the only person I trusted who knew that secret. And it was my deepest secret and my deepest shame. And my colleagues would say, I am going to go see the bipolar crazy woman in room three. And it made me so angry, and I wouldn't speak up. And um, I would hear news reports about how a politician had not even had a chance at an election because someone found out he'd been treated for depression. And I wouldn't say anything. And that pressure of leading a double life bothered me more and more and more. So, what I did was I wrote uh, an editorial that was published in JAMA in 2004, entitled, Normal is a Place I Visit. And um, my psychiatrist said, don't publish it, it'll be suicide. And um, usually I do what I want to, and uh, that was no exception. 
So I, this article was published in the June-July issue of JAMA. It was the longest editorial they'd ever printed in its entirety. They didn't edit it at all. And it described living with, from the inside, living with manic depression. And um, at the end of it, I signed my name and I provided my email. And um, 24 hours after that article was published, my phone started ringing and my email inbox went crazy. I got phone calls. I got a phone call from Pakistan. I got phone calls from every continent and letters and more letters. And of all the hundreds of responses that I received, not one of them was negative. Not one was critical or negative. And they were so touching and so moving. I still have them. I have a stack about this big. They were from physicians who said, I'm bipolar as well. I'm afraid to come out. How did you do it? What's going on with you? Have you lost your job? They were from spouses of physicians and from nurses. They were from parents, a father who was a physician who said, my daughter committed suicide six months ago because she was bipolar and there was nowhere for her to go. She couldn't live with the pain and the shame anymore. And I also received letters from um, medical schools and psychiatric residencies and private psychiatrists who said, this article describes the inside of the mind of someone with bipolar disorder better than any article. Can we please use it as a teaching tool in our residency training in a medical school. And um, that was exactly what I hoped to do. I felt that I had made a little tiny drop of a difference in the world of destigmatizing bipolar disorder. And also in doing that, it was terrifying. I felt emotionally naked. Um, but I set myself free. My two worlds that were so separate, the private me that was bleeding on the inside and couldn't talk about it, and the public me, the authoritative professional persona, had, I had allowed myself to become one person. And those two worlds started overlapping very carefully. I did not sing it out in Seattle, hey world, I'm Dr. Fiala and I'm bipolar. And I didn't proclaim it to my patients, but very slowly, close friends who I trusted, who I had never ever confided in, I very tentatively told my shameful secret. And the majority of them hugged me and told me how brave I was and how strong I was. And um, it was and still is very moving. And never in the eight years since, until last year, which is another story, have I gotten any negative attention for that article. And I'm still so grateful it's out there. And um, I decided at that point that part of my life mission is to be a voice for those that don't have a voice. And to speak out because I do have a voice and I have a small social position in my community and um, making a difference about this issue of acceptance and understanding and destigmatizing mental illness is so very, very important to me. So now to the part about barriers and I would like to talk about the legal barriers or the legal progress we've made, I guess as well as the medical issues, and then also the social issues and the barriers therein, because I feel those are the greatest barriers, really, that need to change. So, quick statistics, which I know you're all aware of. Mental illness is more prevalent than heart disease or cancer in our country. But how much attention does it get? You know, there's the heart walkathon, there's the breast cancer three-day 
really, I mean, how much attention does mental illness get in our society compared to cancers and heart disease? The rate of bipolar disorder in the U.S. is, there are many different statistics. The closest one I could see as being accurate is 4.4%. 4.4%. It's the highest in the world. That I find very interesting. Is it really the highest or is it that other cultures don't identify it and don't report it? There's conflicting information about that. There's a theory that other cultures are still more bound in family and social supports and that they may in fact have less bipolar disorder because they are more grounded in supportive env environments. There's also a theory that I found really interesting that America by its nature of being a melting pot statistically would have more bipolar people because the people who chose to immigrate are those who have grandiose personality and um, who had a will and desire to get ahead, even though the odds were against them, so that people with that tendency are the ones that came to America. Whatever it is, the rate is extremely high. 67%, uh, two-thirds of people who have bipolar disorder never receive treatment. Never. 69% of people with bipolar disorder are misdiagnosed an average of three and a half times. On average, it takes 10.2 years to get an accurate diagnosis. 10.2 years. And on average, four different doctors before they're diagnosed correctly. That's astounding. If you have diabetes, can you imagine getting the wrong diagnosis three and a half times and wandering from doctor to doctor for 10 years and seeing four different doctors before you found out what was wrong with you? We would not accept that as, as acceptable or tolerable medical care. The rates for intentional and unintentional death are two to six times higher among the mentally ill. And that's a combination of suicide and death from comorbidities, other diseases, heart disease, diabetes, pulmonary disease, cancers. People who are mentally ill die more frequently with every other disease. Because why? Because they're more likely to be poor. They're more likely to not be stationary and stable with good relationships with their physicians. They're more likely to not seek care and not stay on their treatment plans. So not only is that morally egregious, but think of the cost involved. If nothing else, think of how many healthcare dollars are spent on not treating these people. So, legally, the legal stuff really, I leave that for other people. I'm not very interested in the law, although of course it's important. The first Mental Health Act was in 1946. Truman um, set up the National Institute of Mental Health with federal funds when World War II vets came home. Not because they had um, shell shock or PTSD, which is what I assumed, but actually because when they were treated for shell shock, the doctors discovered they had so many other mental health issues, they kind of had an aha moment and realized that people have mental health issues, whether they've been in a war or not. Um, the um, American Disability Act was formed in July 1990. It was really the first worldwide declaration for calling for equality for people with disabilities. And it was a public policy committed to removing impediments um, for access and um, equal treatment for people with disabilities in our society. Then in 1996, the Federal Mental Health Parity Act was a big deal. Um, the problem with that is it's been amended many times, and there are now so many exemptions and exclusions that it's really been watered down. Um, small businesses are exempt. Um, in, uh, it often applies only for catastrophic coverage. Uh, so it really, there are so many loopholes that uh, it is not 
what it was intended to be in 1996. And also states have their own parody laws that some of them are really good, some of them are much worse. So, you know, that's sort of the legal scene. Another point that I wanted to make before I move on to medical that, um, again, I, I find really outrageous is our criminal justice system. How many people do we have in prisons? And how many of them are mentally ill? So many are mentally ill. And again, there's a cost factor, but for me, it's the moral factor. People are, are put in prison, they are convicted of crimes, and so many of them have undiagnosed mental illness. If they're lucky, some of them are diagnosed in prison. That's one small benefit they get. But, you know, what kind of system convicts and imprisons people who are sick and who do not necessarily know what they are doing with a clear mind and leaves them there, locks them up and leaves them there? Uh, again, to me, that is, um, that is just unconscionable. Young children who are in um, juvenile detention, so many of those children are mentally and emotionally damaged from childhood, from genetics, from a variety of causes. And instead of giving them the mental health help they need, we lock them up. Um, so there are a lot of other laws. I think we're in good hands there. There are plenty of legislatures, legislators and groups who are working on the laws. And again, that, that issue I think is covered relatively well and is making progress. Um, barriers in access as far as medical care. This one really bothers me. Um, so many issues here. Inconsistencies in training in medical professionals. There are so many doctors who do not know how to recognize or treat mental illness. Um, they have limited awareness, they've had variable training, they have a lack of knowledge, and they have prejudices and biases. Um, there's also a very fragmented healthcare delivery system um, that's called the de facto mental health service system. There's the specialized mental health providers, which are psychiatrists and psychiatric nurses, inpatient and outpatient. There's the general medical primary care system, which is me. Um, there are human services, social service agencies, school-based counseling, VOTEC, criminal justice services, and then lastly, there are voluntary support, like self-help groups and peer counseling. None of these groups talk to each other. There's no connecting link, and they're all funded differently, some privately, some by federal funds, some by state funds, and there is no direct communication. So, there are all these separate little networks that are trying to do good, but there is not one umbrella under which they uh, work together, and patients get fragmented care and fall through the cracks. The insurance industry is uh, disgusting. They distinguish between mental health and physical health, medical coverage, people with mental health issues usually have higher deductibles, higher co-pays, um, they have limited treatment, they have exclusions, they have lifetime limits. I lost my life insurance when I came out of the mental health closet. I no longer have life insurance. You would think someone who admits they have a mental illness would be more insurable, not less. But apparently that's not the case. And people who are in the poverty uh, zone, what they have is virtually nothing because they have even less access to mental health care than those with insurance. Um, so, there also is not adequate money for research, for studies, for appropriate treatment and outcomes, and there are not enough providers and there are not enough beds. Psychiatrists are the lowest paid doctors in the totem pole pecking order of physician re salaries. Um, there are not enough psychiatric beds. Um, this is a personal story, a very personal story. Um, last December, around the holiday time, I always dread the holiday time because I have a large population of patients who are mentally ill, uh, people with depression, with anxiety, and with bipolar disorder. And um, 
every year I have patients in crisis who are depressed and suicidal and don't know where to go. So uh, right before the holiday last year, I had two such patients, two women. Um, neither of them could be admitted anywhere. Luckily, one ended up flying to the Midwest to be with her grandparents who took care of her. Um, the other one had another situation she went to. But on a, again, on a personal note, uh, I have a son-in-law who is bipolar, and he uh, had a terrible crisis in December. He became psychotic and manic. He was hearing voices that told him to hurt himself and to hurt others. And he was in desperate shape. And um, I put on my doctor hat, and I, oh, and also he did not have a primary physician because he uh, was uninsured. Uh, I put on my doctor hat and I called around Seattle for a psychiatric bed. There was one bed left in the county. First I called the county hospital. We have an excellent county hospital, Harborview, uh, and its specialty care is trauma and psychiatric care. I was told by the, uh, at, by the nurse at Harborview, we have so many patients right now, they are Let's see, what was her, what was her terminology? Um, what did she say? They're not holding, they are... She had a peculiar term I hadn't heard before, something like, they are, they are holding, we are holding them here. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, well, we're so full that the patients who we don't have beds for they're, they're just right now, they're not really fully admitted, but they're living in the hallways. They're living in the hall, in a bed. People who are psychotic and who are suicidal. That's what they're doing, until a bed opens up. So anyway, I called the remaining psychiatric hospitals. I found one bed available. And I called them and said, hello, I'm Dr. Fiala, and I'm a patient who's psychotic and suicidal who really needs that bed. Will you hold it for me? And they said, yes. So, my poor daughter was beside herself. She herself has anxiety issues, and she works, and she has a three-year-old, and she just did not know what to do. She was terrified that her husband was going to kill himself. Um, I picked them both up, and the baby, and drove them to this hospital half an hour away. And um, to get into the psychiatric bed, first he had to be evaluated in the emergency room. So we went to the emergency room, we waited and waited. Uh, finally, he was evaluated by a very kind doctor who said um, very gravely, yes, you know, I understand I, that you need that bed. And then the doctor called, someone called the mental, the um, MHP, mental health professional, um, who at least in Washington are generally very young social workers with very little experience who if you don't say the right magic words, and if you're not insured, we'll turn you away. And uh, she spent 10 minutes with James and said, came out and said, he's not sick enough, he doesn't need a bed, I won't give it to him. And I said, are you kidding me? He has talked about nothing else except hearing voices, seeing bugs on the wall, hurting himself, hurting other people, what in blazes does he need to do? Take a butter knife, a plastic knife in his throat for you to give him that bed? And um, she refused to give him the bed and she left. And um, a, the reason she refused to give him that bed was because it was a private psychiatric hospital and he had no money. Uh, and, the, and the admitting or the ER doc came back in and he said, I am so sorry, I cannot believe that happened. And I said, so, so what do we do now? We take home a psychotic, depressed man, and he said, I guess you do. And I said, do you have follow-up with him arranged for tomorrow, which is standard procedure after an ER visit? He said, the best we can do is follow-up in a psychiatric clinic in five days. I said, you better hope he's alive in five days. I said, can you prescribe him some medication? He shook his head and said, I don't even know what to prescribe him. I'm so sorry. So my daughter and I 
loaded him into the car, and after spending four hours with his futile endeavor, drove him home. He had no medication. He had nothing. He was still suicidal, and he's a large man, and he had absolutely nothing. So we then proceeded to a pharmacy, and I do not treat uh, acutely psychotic and suicidal patients in my practice. I'm a family practitioner. But we went to the pharmacy, and I was looking up on my, you know, my computer, my, my PDR, <laughs> what I want, but I thought what I could give him to settle him down at least. So I talked to the pharmacist and said, okay, let's give it, can you please, I want to give him some Seroquel, and I want to give him some Risperdal, and I want to give him some Lamictal. And he said, okay, that'll be $600. <laughs> and I, I was shocked, and I did not have $600 for these medications. And I said, okay, well, let's try again. Why don't we give him some hello and some whatever, and whatever, valproic acid and blah, blah, blah. And he said, okay, that'll be $300. Uh, and I said, okay, here's the problem. What would be the least expensive antipsychotic and anti-anxiety medicine that I could give him? And we brainstormed together and came up with Tegretol and Clomiphen and threw in a few very high-priced Abilifies. And my daughter and I literally sat watch with him for over a week, day and night, mostly my daughter, watching him, not leaving him out of our sight, hoping the medication would start working, and would not leave him alone so this wonderful man would not kill himself. Now, that was a situation with a young couple with no money, and a mother who happens to be a doctor. Imagine that situation with a couple who doesn't happen to have a doctor in the family. Where do they go next? What do they do? Um, you know, I call that my no room at the inn story. And it addresses on so many levels what is wrong with our medical system. No access and dis complete disregard for the poor. Not enough practitioners, not enough beds. Emergency room docs who have no clue what to give someone who's psychotic and suicidal. And the shame and the stigma, even while this poor man was trying to sit quietly while he had terrifying thoughts, he just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And that's what really broke my heart. Nobody should feel that way. And no one should be treated that way. So, medically, we have such a long ways to go. So, socially, which I've touched on a bit already, for me that is really, uh, really at the center of what we need to address in making the world a better place for the mentally ill. The experience of stigma. Stigma causes shame. And shame causes secrecy. And secrecy causes isolation. And isolation causes social exclusion. And it causes others to discriminate and to cause, create stereotypes. I think there are very few areas left in which we truly have stigma and stigmatize one another. I think being overweight, we, we certainly treat fat people terribly. I think that's the last last thing that has to fall. And I think mental illness is right above that. 
We have made progress in so many ways, uh, but this just has to change. In a civilized society, this is just not acceptable. No human being should be treated in a way that makes them feel ashamed. Mental health or mental illness is still seen as an indulgence, a weakness of character, a character flaw. You're supposed to pull yourself together, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, and just get over it. Nobody says that to diabetics or people with high blood pressure. Just get over it. Historically, the mentally ill were separated, mental illness, physical illness, because people with mental illness were thought to be possessed by spirits. In rare cultures, it was considered an honorable thing. They were seen as seers or shamans. But for the most part, people who were mentally ill were thought to be possessed. So I think that's part of where that fear and stigma come from. Therefore, mentally ill people were cared for in secret by their families. And then we developed these huge asylums where they were warehoused and treated abominably. Then, after the institutions were opened in the 1960s and the people were released out into the streets, we had these floodgates of emotionally ill people who had nowhere to go, who became homeless, and we had the talking to Jesus on the street corner situation where homeless, mentally disturbed people had no care whatsoever and um, became part of the invisible, mentally ill picture. So, how do we institute change? Research suggests that if we learn to treat and, and cure these illnesses, that there will be less stigma and that they will, they will be more acceptable. That happened with HIV AIDS, that's happened with other cancers. Um, I think education, education, education at a young age, the younger the better, when children learn health in school, it shouldn't be physical and mental health, it should be health. And mental health should just be a part of it. And that's starting to happen. There's some discussion about mental health in my children's middle school and grade school, but certainly not enough of it. But I think that is critical. So also, we just need to demand more money for research, for uh, treatment options, for studies. We need to change our language. You know, we no longer use the N word. We no, we no longer, hopefully, uh, use pejorative terms when talking about gay, lesbian, transgender people. I think we should get rid of the word crazy. I think we should get rid of the C word. How many times do we use that? I, I use it, you know. I'm going to try not to use it. And I think we should, um, on an individual level, confront and challenge people who we see acting in a way that stigmatizes on a very personal level. Don't use the C word. That's not appropriate. People really are mentally ill. That, that, that minimizes and diminishes their very real illness, their life-threatening illness. I think we need to look at other institutions, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, elderly rights, um, gay lesbian rights, and uh, demand equality, and study closely what's made those movements successful. I think it's been a combination of legislation and demanding what is rightfully theirs, and uh, also education and uh, marketing. And now on the day of uh, um, the media the way it is and uh, computers and uh, it, it certainly is much easier than it, than it was at one time to get social media going. Um,
I think I'm going to just close with something that was part of my normal article, which is still true today. I wrote eight years ago. Statistics indicate that one in five of my medical colleagues is mentally ill. One in five attorneys, one in five teachers, one in five firefighters, grocery clerks, business persons, professors. Think of it, there are so many of us, but we don't talk about it. Discrimination and bias against people with mental illness are among the last vestiges of a socially tolerated prejudice. Our children deserve to grow up in a world where that is no longer so. I want my children and your children to live without the chaos and turmoil that has defined my life and to live in a world where they are respected, whoever they are. Thank you. We have some time if you have any questions or for a discussion or conversation. Yes? Yeah, how did you go about finding and selecting a psychiatrist? It seems like you went through a lot of different doctors and got a... I, your initial diagnosis was a pre depression when they put you on Prozac and... Yes. Okay. And I was diagnosed with bipolar depression when I was hospitalized in an inpatient psychiatric unit for two weeks. Finding the right doctor was very, very difficult, and I went through many uh, bad ones for two years. Um, and I just kept trying. I, it, it's actually funny. I went, you know, one doctor, I called it, I called him, the, if this is Tuesday, it must be Tegretol doctor. Yeah. He literally wrote me five prescriptions at once and said, take this for three days. If it doesn't work, throw it out. Go on to the next one. Yeah. So. I was on Tegretol for three days, and Valproate for three days, and uh, uh, Lithium for three days, and on and on. I was at a medical conference in Carmel, and I, I barely remember even being there. I don't know how I could have possibly metabolized all this. And then there was, you know, the guy who wouldn't ever talk to me. He was sort of very old school. He would sit there for an hour. <laughs> And I would like think up things to talk about on my way there, like, oh no, what am I going to talk about today? <laughs> um, I just kept trying, and I finally um, got someone that was recommended by someone else. He turned out to be a male, and I really wanted a woman, but um, he was just a very good fit, and I'm still with that same doctor after 13 years. So I would say don't give up and ask around. And you can ask for a you know, an introductory interview, and generally those are half hour and are free, and see if someone, you know, connects with the heart and feels gestalt like a good fit for you. How does uh, Seattle mix with your moods? Uh, That's pretty tough for a lot of people. The weather's really bad, yeah, really I'm bad. Right uh, if I didn't have children, aging parents, and ex-husbands there, I would not live there any longer. Yeah. <laughs> I, yes, indeed. I have a light box and a dawn simulator yes. and uh, full spectrum lighting in my house, and I, it's still very, very hard. You your whole house, full spectrum? Not the whole house, oh, okay. but my main, like my kitchen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It still is very tough. Yes? Um, I have a son who lacks insight into his situation. We don't know if it's bipolar. We don't know what it is. What I do know is I have an appointment set for him at the Gifford Clinic at UCSD late this month. Now I have to figure out how to get him there. Do you have any suggestions? How old is he? 22. Is there any mental illness in the family? Yes, his father was diagnosed with bipolar, my ex-husband. Does he know that? Does he accept that his father is mentally ill? Um, probably not. He sees yeah. him as quirky and unique. Well, it, you know, denial is so such a powerful thing. 
And I quit my medications and then denied for many, many years that there was anything wrong with me. So it's not, you know, it's not unusual, and especially at that age. Um, at that age, you really just, you can't force him to go, and you can't um, fool him. If you have a good relationship, I would recommend sitting down with eye contact and having just a real heart-to-heart -heart talk and saying, look, honey, this is the issue, these are the issues your father has. They're genetic. I'm really concerned about you. I love you. And even though you don't think this is true, would you please suspend your disbelief and give this a try for a month? And I wouldn't be above um, bribery. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and if you do this for me for a month, I'll give you X, Y, or Z that you've really wanted. You know? It's hard when you're 22, because no matter what your situation, you figure you're in charge, right? You, you do, absolutely. You're 22. Ab absolutely. My kids range from 13 to 32, I, I know. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you... If you ask him, you can't tell him to go, but if you ask him to go, and if there's something he might want from you in exchange, maybe he would do it. Not a car at this time. Not quite the car. <laughs> yes. Are there long-term effects of taking psychiatric medications such as Sarapol and It has not been studied adequately. There is evidence that going off medication and falling down again and again and again and again causes brain cell death, which is not a, a, a memory loss, which is not a good thing, uh, which I really have noticed in myself. Uh, I'm now on lithium and um, Fluoxetine and Welbutrin and uh, Risperdal, and uh, it feels nice to be stable, and I have been for many, many years. So um, you know, there aren't there aren't really long-term studies, but I don't feel like I have much of a choice if I want to have a, a normal life, considering the options. Yes. I'm having a hard issue with, I caretake for somebody who has bipolar disorder in my family. Uh -huh. And um, it has just sort of fallen on my lap, you know, and because I was the one that sort of recognized it at first. Yes. And, um, and I don't know, I'm kind of anal where I sort of like, you know, try to cover the basis of everything and we found the right doctor, we found the right medicines and now they're in my home and they're living with me. But the family, I feel ostracized by them. And completely like, you know, oh well, like I'm crazy because I'm taking care of this person. And, and it's saving them a great amount of worry uh, as to her life, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so it's been a really, I'm having a real tough issue trying to get over that stigma. And I don't know, like, is there something that could, um, I guess, you know, I've, I've joined groups, and I guess I should probably join another group, a support group for caretaker, but I wonder if other people have that same issue. There, first of all, it sounds to me like they are denying the diagnosis and taking their emotions out on you, rather than processing and accepting what's wrong with this relative. Yeah, I think they don't understand a lot of it. They right. Just Right, and there, there is, there is uh, literature, there are some studies about the halo effect of, of what happens to family members of people with mental illness and how they are often ostracized and uh, how they feel ashamed or frustrated or whatever. Um, they need therapy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, it sounds I'm like they're. It, yeah, it sounds. It sounds like they they feel conflicted and 
you know, ashamed and not sure what to do with this, quote, diagnosis that you have been comfortable embracing. And instead of dealing with their own stuff, it's sort of coming out towards you. So in the literature, I, what I like to do is just keep them aware of how this person's doing. Uh -huh. And then also um, sort of, you know, throw in like, you know, we can suggestions as to what, what they could do to help and also throw out, um, mm -hmm. you know, websites like the International Bipolar Growth Foundation mm -hmm. where they can attach to things like that. Yeah, I Definitely. Education is so important. I think what you can give them in little little bites that are easy to swallow, just slowly trying to, the process of education that, you know, this is a real physical disease. You can find on Google pictures of PET scans of patients with normal brains and patients with bipolar brains, and you can physically see the difference, you know, and say, look, this is a real illness. There's medical evidence of this. and. Your relative is sick, and I'm trying to help her, and, you know, just education, I think, would help them tremendously. And you're right, you do need support. Good for you for doing that. Yes? Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi. I want to compliment you. That you are beautiful, and you speak from your heart, and really, I'm proud to listen to you. Oh, thank you. I wanted to hear, with all the antipsychotics that you've been taking, how you still remain so nice and skinny. And the last people have taken this medication and increased the appetite. That's a secret that I like to learn, you know? Well, thank you. Uh, well, I lost 40 pounds two years ago. Uh, I stopped eating carbohydrates. But it was just my, you know, I, I'm a vegetarian, but I just eat protein, fruit, and vegetables. Okay. And I didn't give up my glass of wine, so. Okay. <laughs> Why are you good? I think it's also helpful in this state. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm a physician also. Uh -huh. I have a bipolar son who's 23. Uh -huh. And I think you used the right word when you said the medical system and insurance system is disgusting. And I feel, like you in many ways, somewhat perplexed and, and kind of I should know what to do, but yet I don't know what to do when I change things. Because I feel medicine has failed, and it's failed in Disney. We're allowing the insurance companies to dictate um, how to treat patients. We're not mm -hmm. fighting hard enough there should not be any separation between you know, mental health and physical health and an insurance company that deals just with mental health issues that's going to deny everything versus you know, physical health. We know we have the evidence now. We've got the PET scan, functional imaging, mm -hmm. et cetera. This mm -hmm. is a real biological, biochemical, functional disease spectrum because we have, you know, I think we're going to find out so much. We put everything in either bipolar or various categories. We're going to find out there's a gazillion diseases. Yes. It's like saying my leg hurts, so there's a lot of things in the process. But yet we as doctors have not yet pushed the insurance companies. Our legislators have said, no, we have to start doing more, as you said, the answer is in really um, organizing and, mm. and pushing this. This is abominable that we are letting this happen in our society. And, um, and we have to discover more tools. There's no way we would treat a diabetic without knowing exactly what the insulin level is and exactly knowing what's going to happen mm -hmm. once we give a medication. You know, uh, we are using all kinds of medicines without knowing what really the effect is, except after weeks and weeks and weeks knowing it's a behavioral effect rather than a real, you know, blood test, functional imaging test, mm -hmm. uh, test test, whatever it is. We're not using these yet. Right. And so, we have a long ways to go, and I am ashamed of the medical health profession and of our legislators and all of us. When you say one in five, we have silence. Exactly. I so agree. You know, I, I worked for hospital systems most of my 17-year career, and um, the drive to, to make a profit for the hospital uh, and 
It was all about winning all the revenue issue, the insurance issue, and my colleagues caused me to leave hospital medicine four years ago, and I'm now in private practice. And um, I treat the whole person, you know, the mind, the body, this, I tell them, I, you know, I'm not just looking at, I'm not a body mechanic. You are your mind, your spirit, your body. And um, patients want that so badly. I, when I left the hospital system, 600 of my patients came with me. They left the hospital as well. And since then, I now have 1,200 patients. Because people, patients crave that. And I, I don't know how you feel, but I think, part of this because I've always been an outlier, but I think um, m most doctors are sheep. I think they really don't care. They go to work, they do their deal, they check in and out, and they go home. It's sad. It's sad. I could not find, and it took me forever to find a psychiatrist that would actually also do therapy and not just do a 15 minute med check. Yes. Yes. What if you have one person not talking to another? How could you not take care of the whole person? Exactly. Exactly. And, and it is, the state of affairs is really, really and sad. And position with all my contacts, et cetera. So mm -hmm. as you said, how, how could the average person even navigate? Exactly, the battle that exactly. The insurance companies on the phone is horrible. I mean, I read thinking what's going to happen when my son turns 26 mm -hmm. and he's off my insurance policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's yeah. sad. It's, it's dreadful. And we have to change it. You know, we, we have to change it somehow. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Okay. Um, that's interesting that you say you, you um, don't eat carbohydrates. I, cause I, went out, I have a friend who is, uh, who's, well, my son is bipolar. Um, and I have a friend who was recently diagnosed as with a seizure disorder. Mm -hmm. And I've done some research, I know, that I guess um, the children don't respond to medications because they put them on a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. I'm just, do you think this sort of diet can, I, I would never do it without the meds, but I mean, can it help at all with bipolar or mental illness, or is it just a good way to control your weight? I, I really don't think so. I don't know. I've been a, a sugar junkie for most of my life, and I did it strictly to lose weight, and I, it hasn't changed my illness at all. You know, I tried um, over the years vitamin therapy, acupuncture, uh, meditation, body work, uh, sweat lodges. Uh, I really tried about everything I could possibly think of that was alternative to heal my disease without medication. And um, for me, anyway, none of it made any difference. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so we were talking previously about your cognitive impairment and the drugs. Is there anything you do in particular to help remedy that? I, I'm sure you exercise, but are there other things on the side that. Uh, no. It's like you're in a uh, profession. Where yeah, you're well, me. the professional question is a very good one. Uh, my brain really seems to work very, very much in two hemispheres. There's the doctor part that remembers that training and that is a doctor, period. And then there's the other hemisphere that's uh, bipolar and loses my keys five times a day and calls my children by my dog's names and all that. So the drugs don't affect the recall at all? No. Of the medicine? Um, it's, it's slower at times, but yeah. not particularly. I just really feel, and I tell my kids this all the time, that my brain is turning to Swiss cheese faster than I think it should be. Although one of my patients calls that momnesia, and I have six children, so I don't know, maybe it's just, just my life in general. But uh, as, just to let you know, an aside, um, my safety mechanism for practicing, I take that very seriously, is my psychiatrist, and he's done that. We've had that deal for 13 years that if I am ever impaired and not able to practice safely, he is my safety net. So I'm very, uh, very cognizant of pay, paying attention to that because I, I do, you know, take care of people's health. Yeah. So, well thank you so much.
so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.